Three weeks ago, uh, my grandpa passed away. And I never was very close with him, but he was a legend because he was the dad of my mum. And um, my mum rang me and just let me know, you know, your abuelito uh, has, has passed. And, you know, we never had a, a close relationship of a family because sometimes in families things are easy and sometimes it's just a little bit more complicated. And maybe you, you understand. And because and, and of distance and relationship, etc., we never saw him much. Uh, but my mum loved her dad. And, uh, and this one thing I knew growing up, is that he was, like, he was a strong man. You might say he was a hard man. But, you know, like I said, he had my mum. So he's a good man. And, 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 but my mum would pray for him. And, and, this, and although they wouldn't talk daily, and they would from time to time, it wasn't often. This one thing I knew growing up is my mum would every single day pray for a dad. And there would be times where I'd hear my mum in a room and I'd know she'd be on her knees, literally, and I'd hear her crying out to God for God to save her dad. Because she knew this reality, that although she loved her dad and she wanted her dad to have a, a good life and a peaceful life, more than anything, she knew that there would come a day where her dad would shut his eyes once and for all and he would be in one of two places. He would either be in eternity with his Saviour or he would be in hell. And this is a reality that every one of us face when one day we shut our eyes too. It's a reality we have to face and we have to be aware of, not in fear, but something that causes us to pray. And I would hear my mum praying out and crying out to God each and every single day. Even when I moved out and got married, I can tell you with this assurance, every single day, my mum intently prayed for her dad. Now she wasn't someone that travelled the world. She came from Santiago in Chile. And, and once she moved here, she wasn't jumping on planes and flying. She hardly went back to Perth. She hadn't seen her dad in many, many, many years. But at the end of last year, she felt the Holy Spirit say, buy a ticket and go to Perth where my dad lived. My, my, where, where her dad lived. And her dad's getting older and, and she, you know, nervous, probably trembling at the knees, bought the ticket and went over and went to see her dad. And my dad was there as my mum had this conversation of connection, reconciliation and love with her father. And it was there three times she asked him the same question. Do you believe in Jesus? Would you give your life to Him? You are going to die and you will be in one place or the other. So do you make a decision today to invite Jesus into your life? And he said this word that changed his eternity. He said, Absolutely. Come on, how good is God? And for years, to be honest, for years, I, I prayed too, but I dreaded the day that He would die because I was so nervous that if He hadn't made this decision, it would break my mum knowing that He never made a decision to follow Jesus. But then I was at my boys' basketball game when my mum rang me. And while there was emotion because she lost her dad, it wasn't grief and sadness because she lost him forever. She knew where He was. He was with her Saviour, His Saviour. Amen? See, Church, this is what it's all about. This is why we are on this earth. This is why we breathe each and every day. This is why when you found Jesus, you weren't left here just to live your life. It was to live a life of sharing faith, love, generosity and kindness so that people would find Jesus. Our life is all about souls, amen? This is what the church is about. Can I encourage you today? As we go to do the salvation older call at the end, that's not the opportunity to sneak out. That's the very reason we do church. The reason we gather is so many things, but primarily and first, it has to be about souls. Otherwise, it's, it's like going to a fine restaurant and eating the entree and leaving before mains. You miss out on the best part. It's like going to the movies and watching the previews but not seeing the main feature. It's like getting married and going back to live in your parents' house. You're missing out on the best parts. Let me tell you, when you come to church, the best thing about coming to church is seeing people find Jesus. Amen? As Christians, 
We're here to lead people to Jesus, to pray and believe and, and look for opportunity when it comes to our loved ones and our families and our workmates and our, and our soulmates and our schoolmates and, and, the, and the person that lives next to us and the person that serves us at Coles and the person that sells us, serves us at the beep beep petrol station, wherever it is, what God has placed us on this earth to do is to point to, plant seeds and pray for that people would find Jesus, amen? And it's our mission before going into war. An army is always given its mission. The general gives its mission. Before running out onto the field, a coach gives the team the mission. Before every Sunday, Pastor Tony, the pastor right here at this campus, gets everyone together and reminds them of the mission. The mission of whenever we gather and come together is souls. As Pastor Tony preached last week, and if you missed the message, make sure you hear it. It's incredible. It'll fit perfectly with today. Often we get distracted. I get distracted all, all the time. If you come over to my house within five minutes of, of sitting there, I've got to be playing with a basketball or a football, or I'm like, I've got to have something in my hands. We're humans. We get distracted. But we focus on what we need or what we want or what we've got to do. And, and that stuff's important, but it pales in comparison to the mission that we have here on this earth. And that's to lead people to Jesus. Amen. What was the mission of the disciples? It is the mission of the church to finish the work, the mission of Jesus. His mission that we read in Luke 19, it says this, For the Son of Man came to, say it with me, Seek and save the lost. It's why when He was filled with the Holy Spirit, I mean, tonight, we've just been in this beautiful flow on Sunday nights of hungering and getting desperate and thirsty for the presence of the Holy Spirit. Tonight, I believe if you're in the room, you're gonna get filled again afresh. Ephesians talks about being filled with the Spirit and it says to be filled ongoingly and repeatedly. If you've been filled before, come get filled up again ongoingly and repeatedly. But when Jesus was filled with the Spirit, it wasn't just for Him. The power was for a purpose. He says in Luke chapter for, for the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see and the oppressed will be set free. He wasn't just talking about the physical, He was talking about their spiritual situation. His mission to us, we see in Mark chapter 16, He said to them, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. And whoever believes and is baptised will be saved. But whoever does not believe, believe will be condemned. He says there's hope that if you preach, if you teach, if you love, and they find Jesus, they will be saved. But He doesn't shy away from the other reality. If they do not hear and they do not believe, they will be condemned. He says, look to the harvest in Mark chapter 9. He said to His disciples, the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. It says, ask. Other versions say, pray. Everyone say, pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the field. In Luke 4, he talks about setting captives free. Pastor Tony's message last week in Acts 16 was about Paul and Silas in prison, chained up, and God sends an earthquake to set them free. And what we do is we often focus on Paul and Silas being set free. The Christians that are set free. And can I tell you, your freedom matters. Financial freedom matters. Health freedom matters. Peace freedom matters. But while we focus on the Christians being set free, the Holy Spirit focuses on a family that was set free. Because the first thing they do when they are set free, they use their circumstance to witness to a family that come to give their life to Jesus. They tell you, maybe you're chained up, bound up in difficult circumstances right now and you're crying out to God, why? And I can't tell you the answer why, but I can believe with you, stand with you, pray with you and declare in Jesus' Name, you will be set free. But maybe God allowed you to be in the circumstances you're in right now to be a witness to others that they may know the freedom that is greater than any other freedom and that is the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. Because we might cry for a while and weep for a while and be chained up for a while, but there is coming a day where we will be in a place with no more pain and no more tears and no more sorrow. 
And it is there that we experience the freedom that Jesus gave His life for. So today, let's just go to another prison story for a moment. Stay in the same theme and look at Acts chapter 12. We've, we find Peter. Peter's in prison. And Peter's about to die. Without a question, Peter has a death sentence. How do we know? Well, when you look at a story in Scripture, make sure you read all the verses around it to get the full context. So we go to the start of chapter 12 in verse 1, and it says this. It says, About that time, King Herod Agrippa, with very strong hands, began to persecute some believers in the church. He, he had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with the sword. And when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Herod. It goes on. No, that's it. That's it. Okay. So King Agrippa has James, the head of the church, killed. And the people love it. So he says, what will I do? I, I, I'll arrest someone else of significance because they'll love that too. And his plan, without a doubt, is to have Peter killed. For the sake of this analogy, I want to I, I wanna imagine Peter is like the lost people that are in our lives. The, the family members, the mums, the dads, the children, the, the workmates, the soulmates, the schoolmates, the person that serves you at Coles, the person that serves you at BP. They're, they're chained up. They're bound up. And the enemy has them in captivity. And, and, and sometimes we can think, you know, yeah, they're in captivity. They just don't have the peace that I have. Or they don't have the church community that I have or, or, or the life choices that I have. But I don't want you to be mistaken today. The enemy didn't just chain up Peter just to make him uncomfortable or to rob his peace or to take him away from the church community. The enemy chained up Peter to kill him. And the same way we have an enemy that is not just trying to make your loved ones and the people that you, are, that you have in your life that are lost uncomfortable or to give them a different life or belief system or to limit them. The enemy comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. He comes to take out their life for all of eternity. So Acts chapter 1 verse 6 says, The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep. Everyone say asleep. Fastened between two chains, between two soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. There are gates, there are guards, there are chains, and there are more guards. Peter is bound up and Peter is chained up. And the enemy is guarding him on every side. And you would have to agree with me, there is no way anyone can get to Peter. He physically, relationally, emotionally, he's too, he's too far gone. No one can get to where he is. There is a death sentence on his life. Just like there was a death sentence on your and my life if it were not for Jesus. If it were not for Jesus, we were condemned to die because of our sin. But because of Jesus, we are rescued from death to life. Amen? And Peter here, without a doubt, is chained up, bound up, limited and restricted on his way to death. I say for the people that are lost in your life, there are often going to be circumstances where you will feel that there is nothing that you can do. Often the loved ones in your life are chained up, they're limited, they're restricted, and it feels like there's demons guarding them on every side. That emotionally, there's no way that you can reach them. Sometimes just because of location physically, there's no way you can reach them. Sometimes because of life relationally, there's no way that you can reach them. I'll tell you today, there is no one that is too far gone from the reach of God. There is no one too bound up that God cannot set them free. And there is no one so hidden that God cannot find them. But this is what we can do. When you cannot reach them relationally, when you cannot really reach them emotionally, when you cannot reach them physically, there is one thing that you can do. You can pray. Amen. So Acts chapter 12, verse 5. It says, while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. What does that mean? It means they prayed intently. It means they prayed Purposefully, 
it actually, a lot of the Scripture, uh, what it says is actually a, is, 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 uh, shown through pictures. It's the picture of praying while stretching. Like someone is imagine, like someone is stretching in their prayers. Because let me tell you, when you can't reach out to them, you begin to reach out to God. You begin to stretch your faith. You begin to pray in a way that calls out and reaches out to Him. Because God can reach where no man can reach. God can reach where no mum can reach. God can reach where no one can go. So it requires you to pray intently to the point of stretching because that gets the attention of God because He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything you can ask, think or imagine. But you've got to pray in a way that asks, thinks and imagines. Amen? But God hears their prayers. Can I tell you? God hears your prayers. And look, look at me today. God hears your prayers. So don't stop praying. Mums and dads, sons and daughters, neighbours, friends, just don't stop praying earnest, limb-stretching prayers. I mean, if you are going to pray limb-stretching prayers, if you are going to pray intently, if you are going to cry out for God, if there is one thing you are going to pray in that way for, let it be souls. I mean, jobs matter, they really do. And health matters, they really do. And where you live matters, it really does. But nothing matters in all of eternity like souls. And if there's something as a church we should be known for, and if there's something as followers of Jesus we should be known for, it should be for the way we pray for souls, amen? And they do, they pray in that way. And God is working in ways they could have never imagined. Let me show you, let me read this passage of Scripture for a moment just to show you what God does. Because the picture of what God wants to do in the lot for the loved ones in your life that are lost. Verse seven, it says, suddenly. Everyone say, suddenly. Hey, tell you something, you never know when your suddenly's coming. Because it comes suddenly. And the suddenly doesn't always come suddenly, but when it comes, it comes suddenly. So you keep on praying and waiting and stretching and believing in the in-between time because in His perfect time, God, it feels like He's doing nothing. He's actually just waiting, moving, breathing, touching, speaking, watering and preparing. But in His perfect time, there is coming a suddenly in your situation in Jesus' Name. Amen. So everyone say, suddenly there was a bright light in the cell and the angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to waken him and said, quick, get up. And the chains fell off his wrists. Then the angel told him, get dressed and put on your sandals. And he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel. But all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realise it was actually happening. They passed the first and the second guard posts and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. And this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street and then the angel suddenly left him. God sends an angel to undo the chains that held him back. God sends an angel to open the doors that were locked shut. Let me tell you something, that when your loved ones, when you can't reach them, when you can't free them, when you can't get through to them, don't stop praying because God can do something on your behalf that you could never do. Just because you can't reach them emotionally, just because you can't reach them relationally, just because you can't reach them physically, doesn't mean that they are out of the reach of God. They're never too far gone. But what you can do is what only you can do. You can get on your knees and cry out to God because in a sudden moment, God can do what no man can do. God can say what no man can say and God can go where no man can do. Go and He can do the impossible for the person in your life. Amen. Because the prayers of a righteous man, James tells me are powerful and effective. I mean, it says he was asleep. Fast asleep. Some of us like, yeah, but you don't understand my family. They don't even want to hear. They don't even, they don't even want to listen. It's like they're asleep. And that's when God steps in. <laughs> that's when God does what only He could do. They may be asleep to the Gospel, but the Spirit of God can awaken them in a moment. So pray, 
so pray, amen? So with everything we do spiritually, there's often something we also need to do naturally. So it goes on now in verse 11 to 15. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. Isn't Scripture just so cool when you just read it? The Lord sent His angel and He saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. When he realised this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. And he knocked at the door in the gate and the servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. And when she recognised Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. Now there's a, there's a prayer meeting, of, of, of there's a church gathering, there's Christians that are gathering and they're praying for one thing to the point where their limbs are stretching intently, praying that God would rescue Peter and do something for Peter. And an angel comes and rescues him and he knocks on the door. And this is their response. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. <laughs> Peter gets to the door of the believers and he, the answer to their prayers are standing right there. Watch this. And they never invited him in. They never invited him in. There was no way he, it's him. There's no way he'll respond. There's no way he'll come in. It's not him. Keep the door shut. It can't be true. There may be a moment that follows your prayers where God wants you to open the door, where God's gonna want you to forgive, where God's gonna want you to call, where God's gonna want you to speak, where God's gonna want you to go, where God's gonna want you to book a ticket, where God's gonna want you to pray and invite, where God's gonna want you to ask. And He's been supernaturally opening doors that you had no clue about. He's been speaking to them in ways you could have never imagined. He's been setting them free in ways you thought was never possible. And all He's asking you to do in this last moment is to do the very thing that He's not going to do for you to open the door door, to maybe ask the question, to give the opportunity to open the door and allow them to step in. I told you before about my mum leading my dad to Jesus, her dad to Jesus. Let me tell you about her leading her mum to Jesus. My mum is from, from Chile, from Santiago, and, and just before Pinochet came into power, this horrible dictator, I think they got on the last plane out of Chile as they escaped the country and came to Australia. So my mum hasn't seen her mum probably at this point for maybe 50, uh, 60 years. But she always told me that she was really blessed to have two mums, her biological mum and the mum that raised her. And while she hadn't seen her mum, her biological mum for many, many years, she always prayed for her mum because my mum is a praying woman. Now, she knew it was impossible to reach her. It was impossible to find her. It was impossible to see her or to speak to her because not only was there a, a physical distance, but without going into all the detail, my, my abuelita, my, my grandma, lived a very hard life. And my mum knew that she wouldn't be living in a home like we live in. She'd be living in the streets of Santiago. So there was no way to get to her. But my mum is a praying mum. And she knows that God can go where no one can go. So my mum is praying and praying for her mum to find Jesus. And one night when she's praying, late at night here in Australia, God puts a number in my mum's mind. And my mum sees this number and she knows the extension for Chile and she recognises this is a phone number. But she doesn't know whose number this is. So my mum, a woman of faith, has been praying, picks up the phone and she rings this number. And on the other side, a person she's never spoken to, a student in Chile, answers the phone. And this person's like, hello, who is this? And my mum's like, well, you don't know me? And the student's like, well, why are you ringing me? And my mum says to her, you need to go and find my mum. And this person's like, but I don't know you or your mum. Where is your mum? And my mum says, she'll be living in this part of Santiago in, this, in the city and she'll be living in the streets. I need you to go find my mum. Well, 
If you ask, you shall receive. This person says, okay, probably freaked out a little, not wondering if they're gonna do it or not. Says, okay, I'll do it. And my mum says, I'm gonna ring you back in a week and ask you if you found her. Well, a week goes by and my mum rings this same number given to her by the Holy Spirit, a student that she'd never spoken to before. And the student answers the phone and says, you wouldn't believe it, I found your mum. She discovers her mum. And my mum says, well, I need you to go back now and I need you to take your phone and I need to talk to my mum. I need you to connect me with my mum. So the student for some reason says yes and goes back into Santiago and rings my mum back. And for the first time in nearly 60 years, connects my mum and her biological mum. But yeah, isn't God so good? (laughs) And this is about five years ago this happened. I'm only able to tell it now because of what goes on in the last few weeks. And, and, uh, and so, but my mum doesn't just want connection for her mum. My mum wants salvation for her mum. So she's been praying for this. So she's talking and connecting. But somewhere along the conversation, my mum begins to tell her mum about how good God's been and how He rescued her from Chile and gave her a good life. And she met this man called Glyn and she had three kids called Josh, Tyson and Shannon. And she lives this life because of the grace of God. And she extends the invitation to a woman that has had nothing to do with her, a woman that relationally has no connection, a woman she should have never been able to reach. And my mum's mum finds Jesus. She says, absolutely. The team can come. Hey, it's not enough for my mum though. My, my mum doesn't stop there. She's a determined woman. Uh, so she rings a local church and finds the local pastor. And she says to the local pastor or padre that she, uh, you need to go and find my mum and get my mum to your church because you don't just get saved, you get connected into a church. So my mum gets her and her partner to get to church. That, uh, just a short time later, my abuelita, dies. If my mum hadn't picked up the phone, if my mum hadn't listened, she would have missed the opportunity to lead her into relationship with Jesus. My mum and dad are so cool, they couldn't go to the funeral, so instead they hired a bus. And they asked the pastor to go through the streets of Santiago and pick up all the homeless people they could find took busloads to the funeral. And my mum said this one thing to this pastor. He did the funeral, he had no choice. Uh, She said to the pastor, you are not to do a funeral, you are to do a salvation message. And that day, dozens of homeless people gave their life to Jesus because of my mum's mum. See, the servant girl and the believers in that house, they're like you and me. See, They're wondering, how is God going to answer my prayers? There's no way they wanna know that relationally, emotionally, physically, I just can't get to them. How can anyone reach them? But today I wanna encourage you, you don't have to save them. He saves them, but you have to pray for them. And when the opportunity comes, you need to open the door and invite them in. Even if it seems too good to be true, even if it seems impossible, even if you're certain they're going to say no again and again and again and again, make the call, show them love, invite them in and give them the opportunity to find Jesus. I mean, what if a sister never recorded a salvation call and sent it to a brother? What if my mum never prayed? What if she had never obeyed and put into her phone a random phone number she had never seen before? What if she never asked someone to go and find her mum? What if she said, "All oh, after all these years, she would never wanna hear from me? What if she never invited her to pray that prayer? I'll tell you this I know, because my mum did. I have never met my abuelita, but there is going to be a day, many years from now, in a place where the streets are paved with gold, in a place where there is no more pain, no more suffering and no more tears, in a place where the presence of God will be known. I will meet my awalita because my mum was willing to pray, my mum was willing to invite, my mum was willing to ring and my mum was willing to open the door. She prayed, she obeyed, she trusted and she invited her in. 
Church, this is the mission. Come on, stand to your feet with me. This is the mission that we would pray, we would love, we would encourage, we would invite, we would forgive. That's for someone today. We would, we would open the door, we would ask. And whether God chooses the suddenly of today or the suddenly of next week or the next season. And whether it be the loved one in your life or the loved one in someone else's life that God brought you to be the angel that unchains them and opens the door. You need to wake up each and every day and say this, Holy Spirit, today is the day. Come on, say this after me. Holy Spirit, today is the day. Come on, Holy Spirit, today is the day. Before you check your phone to see if they text it finally or not, before you begin to speak out the problems, before you begin to talk about what hasn't happened, you need to wake up and get faith in your spirit that leads you to pray. That says, Holy Spirit, today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today's the day they're coming home. Today's the day I plant the seed. Today's the day I get on my knees. Today's the day I begin to pray to the point where my limbs stretch. Today's the day where I call out to heaven. Today's the day where the believers pray. Hello, thank you so much for watching this video today. I pray this sermon has blessed you, encouraged you and inspired you. You know, we may never have met, I may not know you, but God knows you. And I'll tell you today, God loves you. That even before you knew about Him, He loved you. And He has a plan and a purpose for your life. You know, so many of us do life on our own, trying to lead our life in a way that finds answers and finds the peace and finds the joy we're looking for, but we come up short. But God knew that you needed rescuing, that you needed saving, that you needed His love. So He sent His Son, Jesus, to come and pay the price for our mistakes. He lived a perfect life, but knowing we couldn't, He said, I will take their place. So He died and rose again so that His death could pay the penalty for my mistakes and my past, and His life could make a way so that I could have life. I believe that when you believe in what Jesus did, and when you invite Him to be Lord of your life, you can experience forgiveness, peace, hope, joy, purpose and life like you've never known before. It's not about what we've done or who we're not. It's about that we have a God who's good, who can turn things for good and loves you. He's a father, he's a friend, and you can invite him into your life today by simply saying this prayer after me. I'm gonna say this prayer and wherever you are, wherever you're watching around the world, pray this prayer with me. Maybe you once knew God and you walked away. You know what, maybe he's getting your attention today to say, come back into relationship with me. Maybe you've known religion, but never a real genuine relationship with God. Why don't you say this prayer too? And I believe this can be the beginning of a great new day. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for loving me and giving your life for me. I pray you forgive me for my past and you walk with me into my tomorrow. Let me know your grace, your forgiveness, your peace, your purpose, your joy and your hope into my life. I ask you to lead me and guide me from this day forward. Be Lord of who I am in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so glad you prayed that prayer today. I believe that as you did, the peace, the grace, and the love of God comes into your life. You know what? The past is real, but it doesn't have to dictate your future. Let the love, the grace, and the Word of God go with you from this day forward. And I believe the best days are ahead for you. If you prayed this prayer or you want to know more, maybe you're on the journey, why don't you flick us an email so we can send you some material about following Jesus. We can maybe connect you with a local church near you that you can do life with, get good people around you, and we would love to pray with you. I'm so glad you prayed that prayer. I'm so glad you're on the journey of following Jesus. I'm so glad you listened today. God bless.